y'all don't mind. Then I'm going to turn it over to, to Mark Austin and, and, uh, and Gabe Garfield from the National Weather Service and Norman uh, to, to make a really fantastic presentation. But uh, I, I've known Tim for almost 20 years. Tim and I first ran into each other, and believe it or not, on the Palmer Divide on Interstate 70 back in June of, two, uh, I'm sorry, in June of 1994. Uh, we had actually, uh, there was a, a, a nice little setup that day, good boundary going up out through there, and there was a line of uh, towering cumulus that went up and started, uh, started sparking and, and uh, turning into some pretty decent storms, and I took off that I-70 and pulled off at the Cedar Point exit. Anybody knows where Cedar Point is? Uh, my wife knows where Cedar Point is. She had, she had a really fantastic tornado uh, event out there on May 10th of 04. But, uh, uh, I pulled off on the side of the road, and right behind me, Tim pulled off, and uh, we're watching this this uh, line of cumulus tower. And it had <coughs> one tower had a, had an, an eerie funnel, a really goofy looking funnel that dipped that, that down and went back up into uh, into the same tower. And so, you know, that that, that was the beginning of a, of a long friendship for with, with Tim and I. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Paul really well, but but from what I met of Paul, he was a fantastic young man. And uh, just, just full of passion. Now, Carl and I, on the other hand, uh, 2001, April 18th, and anybody chased in Kansas that day, there was a big HP supercell that formed not far from Hutchinson and then moved across the interstate uh, area and uh, produced a lot of hail and a couple of weak tornadoes and such. And I was out there chasing by myself. And I, I happened to pull off that rest stop coming up 135, uh, right uh, up toward Lindsburg, you know. Uh, a lot of people know where that is, and uh, I was just kind of frazzled that day because I drove all the way from Denver Chase, and I was driving all the way back, and it was already like 9, 9.30 at night, and the, the front had gone through, and it was getting really cold, and, and I'm like, oh man, I still got about a six-hour drive, six-and-a-half-hour drive to get back to Denver, so I'm not going to get back till 4 a.m., so I pulled off there and was sitting there, and I, I saw these headlights pull up behind me, and I'm like, oh man, it was a, I don't know if it was a cop or you know what, what it was. And uh, lo and behold, this young man came, got out of the car. Uh, it was Carl. He came up to me and uh, and uh, knocked on my window. I rolled my window down and looked at me and he says, hey, you're Roger Hill. And I'm like, yeah. And he said, I'm, I'm Carl Young. And uh, so we started talking about the storm and everything. And he was just so full of passion on, on, on the, he was just, you know, really, really excited about, about being out there chasing and, and every storm. And that's kind of the way that I've always chased. If anybody chased with me, you, the, you know, have been on any of my tours, you know, I get really excited about severe weather, and that's the way that Carl was too. And uh, Carl, believe it or not, came out and was actually a tour guide on our on our Silver Lining tours tours back in 2004. Tim even came out with us and and uh, and and uh, was a tour guide with us uh, in the 2002 or three time frame. Uh, we were over in Iowa a couple times, and you know he had his old white uh, Dodge Caravan back in those days, and uh, he had this, you know, seats pulled out and all the electronics and everything all set up in that, and, and he was just so fantastic talking to all the guests, and he'd have the guests ride in the van and, and in his van with him, and uh, everybody that came out and, and they, you know rotated back to our van the next day, they just they were just worried about Tim and his knowledge and and just you know how how. Uh, you know, just how excited he was, you know, to listen to. And so, my friends and brothers, I know you're up there looking down at us right now. So here's a toast to you all. David Mark, it's all yours. Thank you, Roger. Well, uh, some of you know me, and most of you don't. My name is Mark Austin. I work at the National Weather Service in Northern Oklahoma. And myself and Gabe Garfield here uh, hope to present you some of the events that happened on May 31st and also give you some insight into our personal stories and how those stories eventually kind of got blended into this story of Tim and Carl and Paul. But before I start the presentation, I did want to at least acknowledge the folks that Put this whole thing together. I mean, I think this is probably record attendance, right, for the Storm Chasers Convention? So thanks to uh, Roger and Karen and folks running the sound and light and everything else, uh, maybe we can get a round of applause for them. And there are five other individuals in this room who have much more strength than I do uh, 
it's hard for me to get up here and talk in front of everybody, given that a lot of this gets kind of personal. Um, but I did want to at least acknowledge that Tim's wife, Kathy, and both of his daughters, Jenny and Amy, are both in the room, as well as uh, Sal and Otto, uh, Carl's parents. So uh, we can just <laughs> Yeah, 
Very deep moist layers, so we already have a lot of moisture in place. We have southerly flow, there's no reason for moisture not to keep feeding into this area. Instability is on the extreme end, 4,000 to 5,000 joules per kilogram. Deep layer shear is definitely sufficient, 40 to 50 knots, what you want. And uh, kind of tied into the shear idea, more of a low level shear uh, parameter is storm electricity, which we mentioned a couple times earlier today. Uh, for those of you who aren't real familiar with sounding analysis uh, and the various severe weather ingredients, think of storm relative felicity as a measure for the ability for a storm to require low level rotation. And so the higher that number is, and it's believed that about 150 or so is sufficient, um, the higher the number is, the better chance you have for significant tornadoes. So right off the bat, we're seeing uh, somewhere, you know, 0 1 kilometers, about 113 or so. Not terribly impressive. And that ties into the photograph here. Just keep an eye on this, you don't have to know exactly what it is, but I want you to compare that to the sounding at 7 p.m. Okay, so I keep having to pull my pants up here. I guess I should have tied my belt. Uh, <laughs> hopefully I don't fall off. It would be uh, really sad for you guys. Uh, so, so if we compare the 1 p.m. sounding, keep it too close to that speaker there. If we compare the 1 p.m. sounding to the 7 p.m. sounding, now we already have storms going on, so it's not quite at the time of initiation. But we see that we still have a very high instability there, three to 4,000 joules. Deep layer shears actually increase about 50 to 60 knots now. And look at our velocity values. We were looking at about 120 or so earlier. Now our level velocity is in the range of, say, three to 400 meters square per second squared. That's impressive. When you have that much instability, you know it's going to be a bad day if you got a storm. And we did. I mentioned the photograph. Whereas before we had kind of this anemic looking on the back, eh, there's some cyclonic curvature there, but not great. Compare that to what we have here. I mean, that's just classic there. Large area there, big cyclonic curvature. And the key to that is this increase in backing and low-level winds. So I have a quick note on that. Photographs and storm below felicity. And I didn't mean to get too technical here, but I think it's an important point for this day because it fed into what we thought was going to happen. Okay, so one o'clock we have this, like I said, kind of an anemic photograph, and the area between the photograph and the storm motion vector, which is this guy right here, is proportional to the storm relative felicity. So the larger area, which we have at 7 p.m., shows that your storm relative felicity has increased dramatically. And all the models kind of bend on that. So basically the idea was, we're monitoring this, and we already had a bad feeling about the day. We already knew it would be pretty significant. Um, and that just confirmed it. So just to recap the ingredients, there's you know, the, the gamut there. This is, like Tim Marshall said, a perfect setup for big supercells, big tornadoes. And we also have our lifting mechanisms there, a stalled out front, and dry line intersecting that. And I had to use one of John Davies' plots here. I think he showed this actually earlier this morning. Although he was using the, uh, I think the SPC mesoanalysis uh, variables. But if I took the values from the 7 p.m. sounding and plotted this, what this shows is anything to the right of this curve here is considered to be a violent or killer tornado. He's plotted a few of these here. Um, so I took the parameters we had and wanted to illustrate kind of where that was in the parameter space. And if you can see it right there, it's a little hard to read. This is the Joplin, Missouri tornado, roughly right below. So we're dealing with an extreme cape, a pretty good low level shear environment, about 7 p.m. anyway. Um, so again, this is just to illustrate the kind of you know, serious event we were foreseeing here. I've already kind of looked at the surface overview there. Uh, a few things, like I mentioned, we were looking for uh, hints at what time things were going to go, and exactly where things were going to go. Although we had a pretty good idea that it was going to be somewhere near that boundary intersection, because we had a pretty good cap in place, and we knew we needed something to kind of push through that cap through the day. So then we start turning to high resolution models. There's a couple different runs of the wharf here, and you can see we did a pretty darn good job uh, at initiating storms in the right place. Uh, the high resolution NAM here also showing the same thing, that's at 7 p.m. Okay. So, 
we have this idea of what's going to happen, what's going to unfold. We know it's going to be a bad day for somebody. And we all have a bad gut feeling about it. We, you could ask anybody in the office, what were you feeling on May 31st? Well, we knew it was going to get pretty bad, especially in light of what happened on the 20th. We've already got a lot of moisture in place. Everything's there. It's just a matter of when and where. So that's what we were keying in on. The strategy, early in the morning, keep in mind that I had come off of a May 30th shift. I was working on the that, that evening as well. And fortunately, we didn't have a lot of tornadoes that day. But we did get a lot of really big hail. You can ask my brother Paul about that if you want detail. Um, so I come in about 7.30 in the morning, 7, something like that. And the idea is, let's get out of this. It's a Friday afternoon. We're going to have storms probably initiating between 5 and 7 p.m. People are going to be leaving the city because it's rush hour already. They're going to be going south to Dallas for the weekend or getting out of town. So we want to get on top of this, okay? So before I even came in at 5.30 in the morning, and it's pink. <laughs> before I even came in at 5.30, now we had a guy post a graphic, and he actually even mentions tornadoes perhaps violent in the red shading area. So we really were trying to get on top of this. We had a pretty good feel. It's going to be a bad day. And we have, of course, timing graphics based on high resolution models and where the triple point or the boundary intersection was. Um, something else our office was doing were these weather briefings. This is an example from May 20th. These are actually city officials from war. This very office actually was impacted later in the day. And they were watching our briefing, kind of getting an idea, okay, what's the weather service thing? Not that we're always right, but, you know, we try to do our best. And you can see it on May 30th, or May 20th, we had pretty good attendance, on May 31st as well. One of the really big factors, one of the really big things, we've been getting into this year, and I think last year, really pretty recent, is social media. Now, the weather service, in general, has uh, been a little slow uh, to get on board with the social media thing. But we've really tried to, to be pretty aggressive with it. And we've gotten a lot of really good feedback uh, based off of both May 20th and the May 31st of that. Uh, so this is just an example of a tweet that we sent out that actually made it on ABC News. Uh, so getting the word out, uh, not even just on a local, local scale, but on a national scale. Um, and this is a really important graphic here. Um, we, we, we knew that people would already be a little uneasy about the fact that we were calling for violent tornadoes again so close to what happened on May 20th. And we knew that there would be an issue with people trying to leave because they thought they would die if they stayed in their house, no matter what happened. So about 2 o'clock, we put this graphic out. And it says, basically, if you don't feel safe where you are, you don't have a substantial shelter, and you feel in danger, you need to go somewhere now and do it, you know. If there's a storm on radar, it's too late, basically. You, don't, you probably won't have time if there's a storm on radar. So go ahead and do it now and let someone know where you're going to be just in case you know, they need to be able to touch it. So, again, we were really trying to be aggressive and getting out ahead of this because we knew it was going to be uh, something people could possibly panic about. Of course, we put a graphic out about the standard safety rules. Take shelter in a shelter if you've got one, otherwise interior room, lowest level, that kind of thing. And just a few other posts to illustrate that we really tried to be aggressive with the social media thing. And that actually caught on, uh, not only in our office and, you know, through the people that follow us, but also uh, we have a few agencies like the Department of Transportation in Oklahoma, who's recently been showing, uh, you know, Various things on their billboards, on their interstates. Hey, heads up, there's going to be bad storms between this hour and this hour. Probably shouldn't be on the road. And even the Lamar billboards in Oklahoma City have started uh, carrying different messages uh, from our office. So we have a great network of folks uh, getting the information out there that really helps in a situation like this. Okay, so we're going to get a little bit more into the event itself now. Uh, this is the operations layout for the Norman Forecast Office. And um, I was the warning forecaster for the El Reno storm, and this is where I was, right here. Let's see if I can find the button. There we go. Um, and we had another warning forecaster adjacent to me, and then behind us was Rick Smith, who you'll see in just a minute. He's actually watching this presentation right now. I 
expect a, a nice report from him when I get back. Uh, all the things I should have should have said. I'm just kidding, it's great. Um, but he was doing the social media, and you can see here that the same thing was communication. And we had a great, seamless uh, line of communication between the three of us that really helped. In fact, at least on one or two occasions, I was still typing the warning out, and he already had it on Twitter. This is coming in. We're going to put a warning out for this area. So, the, the whole social media drive has, has really been uh, instrumental in, in increasing our reach. I mean, weather radio is one thing, but everybody's got, uh, you know, a mobile phone that is connected to Twitter or Facebook. So, it's been a big thing. Uh, so, here's Rick, and he's on the social media desk. Uh, this panel of four different monitors here. And he's amazing. He's able to actually keep track of everything. I don't know how he does it. And this is me here. This is what this, uh, this desk looks like. There's actually a, uh, a wall here that's the situational awareness display. Okay? That has eight screens, nine screens. Anyway, it's got a lot of screens, and uh, we watch all the local news channels on there so that if something happens, you know, we can, for instance, a wildfire breaks out. Well, we can call the people if we need to and say, hey, do you need a forecast? You know, what's fire going uh, So, See that here, I'm facing that situational awareness display. There's Gary England. He's no longer Channel 9, but he was there on uh, May 31st. And some of you might have been like, why is this guy wearing this ugly pink shirt for this presentation? <laughs> you would have thought he would have picked something nicer, right? A suit. I mean, he's supposed to be a keynote speaker, right? He's a big shot. Um, so you can tell I'm wearing this shirt that day. It's pretty tacky shirt. Um, but I thought, you know, in memory of the day, and to kind of channel the experience again, I guess, I can go anywhere. Okay, so I'm there, I'm waiting, I was told, you're going to be the morning forecaster again today. And when I got in there, I was like, man, I was morning forecaster yesterday, can't you do it with somebody else? <laughs> so, we're there, we're waiting, and waiting, and of course, knowing that the longer we wait, the more instability is going to build, and things are going to get pretty crazy pretty quickly. So, there was supposed to be a sound of that, but it didn't work. Oh well. There it is. Alright. That was my attempt at being like Tim Marshall there. It didn't go over very well. Uh, maybe next year. So, so, we got the visible satellite loop here, and you can pretty well see that uh, stalled boundary and where it intersects the dry line here. That's where things get pretty interesting pretty fast. Okay, we're going to skip all the garbage and go straight to the Oriental School. Because we've already seen kind of a lot of this earlier today. And I thought, you know, when I was asked to do this presentation, that rather than do a frame by frame radar recap of the tornado, I mean, we've already seen that a couple times today, that maybe I would just put it up here and let it loop through two or three times and just give you my perspectives on the warning situation. Um, I will say, I was very surprised and very impressed at how calm and how quiet the office was. Um, we have two great uh, managers in there, they were there the whole time. Uh, there was never any second guessing, it was very smooth. But I will also say, I've been in the weather service since 2009, I've been a forecaster since 2012. I've been in a tornado warning situation twice. The first one was April 15, 2012, at 12 a.m., the tornado that struck Woodward. That was the first tornado warning I put out. And this was the second storm I wanted on. So, my goal for 2014 is to not warn a storm that produces a tornado that kills people. I know that sounds kind of depressing, but it really is. Um, so, this is kind of the progression of things, and I will say there's nothing that can really prepare you for sitting there in front of the screen and seeing something so powerful, so awesome. And having this feeling of, wow, this is scientifically incredible. Uh, these kinds of velocities I haven't seen since Greensburg, basically. Um, but then also knowing that you're the guy on the front lines that's telling people, hey, it's coming, and this is where it is, and you don't need to be anywhere near this thing. And not really having any control over the fact that it's going to kill people. You know? Uh, so it was really tricky, and uh, certainly something I've struggled with uh, since it happened, but nonetheless, I got through the event, got through the day, and um, I guess we're ready for the next spring, but this spring is coming around the corner. 
So, the thing I'm going to kind of end with, and this will start moving us in the direction of the damage survey and more personal stories uh, about what happened. Um, this was something that really freaked us out in the office. We have an example here of the contraflow that was associated with Hurricane Rita back in 2005, which was coordinated by state officials in Texas. And then we have the example from El Reno, which was completely panic induced. Um, there's no way you can blame a single person for what happened here. <coughs> this is a multitude of factors. This is May 20th, May 19th. This is um, just, it's just sheer fear. Um, and like I said, helpless. You feel like it doesn't matter where you are, you're, you're not going to escape this thing. Just try and drive as fast as you can and get away. Um, so, when we saw this in the office, there was a really uh, a tone of, of concern. Um, I, I, I recall the look on Rick Smith's face, I've never seen him so scared in my life. Um, and of course, he tweeted out this, if you're stuck in traffic on I-35, you're in danger. You have to get to a building or safe shelter. And this was the footage at the same time from Channel 1 of the airstate. Totally backed up. Um, this is not something I plan on talking about, but Dave and myself did kind of a backhand, backhand calculation of what would have happened if the Arena tornado had actually moved into southwest parts of the metro, which were relatively unpopulated with respect to the rest of it. But we just looked at fatalities with north-south roads that were completely full of traffic. And the number we came up with on the low end was 200 to 250 people. And that's just the vehicles, and that's only one person in each vehicle. So, you can already see this, this could have been a complete disaster, a complete nightmare. And we got really fortunate that it didn't work out that way. So, I'll, I'll start to conclude here. My impressions on this event, um, as I said before, uh, the office in Norman is excellent. It was great. Um, it was a very calm environment, very supportive, no criticism. There was never any second guessing. But nothing can prepare you for something like that. I mean, you really can't. Um, you know, watching it at home unfold on radar when you're not the one actually issuing warnings, totally different experience. Um, lots of conflicting emotions. Um, still have conflicting emotions. Um, complete adrenaline, excitement, also total fear, um, concern. Uh, like I said, you know, people are dying, probably. So it gets a little dark, um, and it's hard to it's hard to manage those conflicts internally. Um, and something I've dealt with since then is this complete loss of control and kind of a helpless feeling. Um, I've actually had some, some anxiety issues after this whole event occurred. Um, so I, I can kind of sympathize with John Davies. I know he kind of spoke to that this morning. Um, and I can say, um, until recently, and maybe even still, I, I don't know if when I want to chase again. Or, you know, I love tornadoes, but this kind of thing, it's, it's just life-changing. Like um, so, so I'll go into a short story here uh, before I stop. Um, May 31st came and went, and I finally got home because people were backed up on the road that goes to my house. It took me an hour and a half to go like two miles because everybody who had headed south was sitting in parking lots. Um, and the day came and went, it didn't have power when I got home. Um, I had to work the next day, so I got up, went to work, and uh, I recall I was working on a website for the event, because anytime you get a big tornado event, you know, the weather service tries to get a web page up, sometimes it takes a while, um, but I was working on that, and I recall that Gabe was out doing the damage survey, um, and he'll get into that a little bit more uh, in detail here shortly, but I remember him texting a few pictures to Rick Smith, the morning coordination meteorologist, who was sitting beside me. And this one particular picture came in, and Rick said, oh my. And I said, oh, what is it? And he showed me this picture. And I said, wow, what, what kind of car is that? And Rick did a quick exchange with Gabe, and Rick said, it's a Chevy Cobalt. I was like, oh, I didn't think anything of it at the time. It's like, well, that's, you know, if anybody's in the car, that's tragic, you know, because they probably wouldn't have made it. So later that evening, um, 
went to dinner with a guy named Scott Curl. Scott is a forecaster in Norman. He issued a tornado emergency on May 20th for more. He also, coincidentally, happens to be the person that issued the tornado warning or tornado emergency on May 3rd of 99. So we went to dinner, you know, just to kind of decompress a little bit, talk about it, get to feeling better, pat each other on the back, whatever you want to call it. And went home, fell asleep pretty quickly that night, and got a, a call from, well, a text from Brandon Sullivan, and then a call from Gabe. And Gabe said, have you heard of the rumors of three chaser fatalities? And I said, well, I've heard rumors, and I did see video captures of, or not video captures, but radar captures of this massive couplet going over these spotter network icons. And I thought, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. And he said, well, it's, uh, it's hard to say this, but the rumor is it's you know, Tim Paul Carl. And immediately, my mind flashed to that image and the cobalt. And I knew it was true. There was no denying it. So that's kind of my personal story, and it falls out from there. Um, I'll let Gabe fill in the blanks there, but Gabe's going to come and talk about the survey and investigating their path and their encounter with the tornado. Thanks again, Mark. That was, that was really good. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Kate Garfield. I work at the National Weather Service as well. Um, I'm not a forecaster, uh, at least by trade. Uh, I work for the Cooperative Institute for Mess Scale Meteorological Studies. That's a mouthful. And uh, I basically work at the NWS most of the time, so I've gotten to know Mark and the other guys really well. But uh, anyway, uh, see, I think I'm going to cover with this one. Oh, there we go. Uh, what's ahead? I just want to kind of overview exactly what I'm going to be talking about uh, for the next few minutes. First of all, I'm going to talk about the damage survey. And no, I'm not going to talk about the 3 5 rating thing. You can ask me about that later. Actually, ask Mark. <laughs> anyway, um, no, we're going to talk about this sort of informal investigation that happens. After, after the damage survey, I was uh, given a lot of information uh, about the tornado um, from different people just based on the fact that I was involved with the damage survey. And so I felt like, well, since no one else was really uh, around with all that kind of information, I felt like it was necessary to step up to the plate um, and take care of some of that. Um, and finally, that resulted in uh, the story, the Twistex, Twistex story from that day. And I'm going to uh, detail uh, what happened to the best of our knowledge. And uh, this is a, a presentation that only the families have seen so far, and I'm going to share it with you tonight. Um, it's going to be tough, um, but hopefully some of those lessons that uh, Chuck Doswell and uh, John Davies and others and Tim Marshall have talked about today, hopefully some of that will sink in. I really think it's really a time that we need to, to really learn these lessons. And finally, uh, some personal reflection. So it won't all be sad. I hope it won't all be sad. We're going to talk about the good times, too. We want to remember that. We have to get through some of this tough stuff first, but we want to get to the point where we can talk about the lives of Tim and Paul and Carl and how much they meant to all of us. They were such great guys, and so we're going to finish up in that way. Okay, first of all, the damage survey. Okay, just to talk about how this all started for me. Um, I was involved with the um, May 20th damage survey, so um, there were several people involved uh, with that sur uh, survey in this room. Chuck Doswell is one of them, of course, Tim Marshall. And I was uh, scheduled to uh, take part in the damage survey between, I think it was Western and Telephone Road. If you know more at all, that's where the, uh, the worst damage happened. Uh, Briarwood Elementary School, the Plaza uh, Elementary School, that's all in that area. It was a really, really tough thing. I showed up on uh, May, May 21st. That morning it was very cold, it was dreary, it was cloudy and rainy. And actually, we had to wait for a few, a uh, couple hours actually, to wait for that rain and the thunder and the lightning to stop. And I remember um, Tim Marshall, of course, when you're getting out there with Tim Marshall, he is you know, just an incredible uh, storm surveyor, as everyone knows. But he gets out there, he's always, you know, even raining, it's a, the lightning is going, and he's kind of getting under these porches and trying to, trying to do the damn survey. So we're out there, we're looking at this stuff. And I, I remember, I'm sharing this with you to, to kind of, talk about the same things that Mark talked about with the emotional aspect of this, but there was a, uh, there, were, there were a lot of houses just west of the Closet Elementary School, 
with that, or just really hard to build. Um, and you know, basically just straight nailed in. And about a line of about 10 of them were completely swept off their foundation. Nothing left. And um, I remember uh, seeing um, this bat, bit of rags uh, in the, in the uh, in the rain and the, the puddles there, uh, and it had blood on it. Um, and I've never before been in a situation like that, where you see what's happened within the last 24 hours. Someone very likely was either injured or passed, I don't know what happened there. Um, but it just really hit home. So you see the, the cadaver dogs at um, the Plaza School. And so this was all leading into May 31st. It was a tough time. If you were in Oklahoma at this time, it was really tough. And so then this happened. Um, and so that's what's going on. So this was actually a fluke for me to do the all Reno survey. I talked about the May 20th survey, was doing the biggest and the baddest of, of all of that. But on, on May 31st, this was the guy that I was scheduled uh, to look at uh, with a couple of other people. But this was a kind of interesting situation. I, I couldn't drive a government-owned vehicle. There, there are some rules that anybody who's in the weather service knows about this. There are rules about who can drive their cars. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Sims guy, so they said, you can't drive, so, well, uh, you want to join the El Reno team? I said, sure thing. And so that, I went west uh, with Tim Marshall and with Don Burtz. And the first thing we encountered as we went west was this extensive damage path just east of El Reno. And that was, that was really strange to me, uh, just to see how large it was. I didn't think we had a three mile wide tornado here, but we, we tested, we looked at the odometer, and drove west, and sure enough, it was about three miles wide. Of course, we found out later that the tornado had looped over that particular part. So it wasn't that wide there, but uh, we knew we had a very, very large tornado on our hands. So, the primary thing that we were looking for that day, and we, we knew that there was a big, beastly tornado that day, so we wanted to know, okay, how strong was this thing? And so this was some of the first damage that we came up with. It was actually kind of surprising. We thought we'd find something more resembling a four or five, uh, but we, we couldn't find anything in that. Uh, Rick Smith, as Mark was uh, alluding to, was interested in getting images of, of the things that we saw along the way, so we could know, um, maybe release a public information statement to say something about the strength of the tornado. So we went along and really didn't see much. This concerned me though. Um, the day before I had been chasing, and I remember being on 15th Street, uh, if anyone knows where 15th Street is, it's about four or five miles south of, of I-40 on, uh, you know, you go about south of I-40 and off of 81 there, and I remember looking back to the west and seeing this line of chasers and the wedge tornado was right behind me. I was like, I really hope that those people made it. And I remember seeing this the next day and became very, very concerned about the possibility that some, some chasers had died in this, uh, in, this, in this particular tornado. This was about the best, best or worst damage that we could find. This was just a little bit east of Highway 81. I believe it was off of Reno. Uh, we rated uh, the tornado F3 at this point. Um, but we, couldn't, we really couldn't find any uh, evidence of anything stronger uh, than a uh, three. And that was actually really surprising to me. Um, and so that afternoon, um, it was probably 1 or 2 p.m., I texted uh, Rick with an update. We're headed to uh, the areas of east of 81. We're at the intersection of 10th and Radio. He said, oh, that's interesting. I said, well, what's, what's interesting about it? He said, um, there were three fatalities at that location. I said, oh, really? I said, well, we found something. And this is what we found. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, at that point, didn't really process it. But Mark's story, I won't reiterate what, what Mark said, but this is what, how we found out. We put two and two together, and it was, it was really tough. Um, to be on a damage survey for a tornado that, that kills your friends. Um, but we, we persevered, and uh, later that afternoon, um, uh, in the evening, we ran into some great people, some of them in this room, uh, who were out there at the site collecting uh, all the personal effects uh, of Tim and Paul and Carl. Some of them are in here. I can't even name all of them. We know Mike Scanlon was out there. Eric Fox was out there. And Tyler Constantini. There was a whole list of people, 20, 30 people out there working to collect these items. Um, I think I skipped ahead, but um, anyway. So this is the damage points. Now back to the damage survey. Uh, we had to get this product out pretty quick. I had, uh, as you probably can imagine, the National Weather Service needs to release this information as quickly as possible so that they can uh, satisfy the needs of 
uh, our media members, and they wanted to know exactly how wide this tornado was and how strong it was. Well, we were only able to confirm uh, F3 through the damage, um, but one of the biggest things that was a huge problem for, for us was to try to figure out how wide this thing was. As uh, Chuck alluded to, what's a tornado? I mean, your definition, the, the, the atmosphere doesn't care about our particular uh, version of how it, it does what it does. Um, so I thought my best way to do this, because honestly there was like about seven miles worth of damage going north-south on, on 81, and I couldn't identify what was career flank downbound and what was tornado. So uh, we uh, sent this PNS out at, at first. It's, that's a, the, the infamous Twitter bird that some of you uh, saw out there, and uh, had a pretty interesting shape. It's kind of kind of a nice classic shape in spite of what the tornado did, but. Um, Anyway, uh, had its wide point, uh, 2.6 miles wide. We had uh, worked with Howie Bluestein and the Rax Bowl radars to try to get some information uh, from, from them. And that's how we got the, the maximum width from, from the radar. Now, we knew that that shape was probably not what the tornado was, but we had our deadlines. So we uh, actually turned to the radar uh, group, uh, talked to Jeff Snyder. Uh, this is an uh, image, of course, that was widely circulated on the internet. I don't think it was supposed to be, but it got out. And uh, it was showing the satellite tornado uh, just northwest of that major tornado um, about 6.15 that evening. And so we wanted to use the radar information to try to narrow down how big this tornado was. Uh, so there's the Twitter bird, and this is what we did. Okay, so you see the damage points out around this, uh, around this shape are a little bit outside of, of that particular um, contour. Um, and so we got the... Uh, we, we got the widths from uh, the rocket radar, so they have, we used the 30 meter per second contour. And what that means in layman's terms, the ice uh, that just means we use the edges of the tornado path, assuming that the edges was about 30 meters per second, or about, I guess that's what, 65 miles per hour, or about EF0. Uh, and so we tried to narrow things down, got the edges from that, and then we produced a new gap. This looks, instead of like a Twitter bird, this is more like Nessie, or, uh, I don't know, some sort of large slug. Um, anyway, but comparing them together, you can see that we, we trimmed a little bit off of the, the western part of the path and kind of narrowed it down uh, in the center part and expanded it some uh, further east. Okay. All right. The other thing we did, um, we got the uh, center of uh, the tornado path from the Raxpole group. So Jeff Snyder and I spent an afternoon doing flat lawns and and plotting them on Google Earth and trying to figure out where the heck this center went. And by the way, tornadoes apparently uh, are very asymmetric in terms of uh, the wind field was definitely not uh, you know, symmetric about the, the center. The center wobbled around a whole lot. You can kind of see that here. I also plotted in the blue, you can kind of see the 88D centers, which actually, you know, not, not too shabby. I mean, considering it's from Twin Lakes radar and you actually have it, you know, centered pretty close to where it actually was. And so we did a little uh, interpolation and put some, uh, some uh, uh, centers in there. So the full product at the end looks like a little like this. You all have seen this uh, for, for a little while now. And so that was actually something I wanted to do because I'm, I was interested in knowing why the heck I was driving for 15 minutes a night on, on May 31st and couldn't get away from the tornado. It seemed like we, we were no closer than a mile and a half when we decided to need to go east toward 81. Uh, and then we continued driving, and then this thing kept on getting closer until it was within, you know, the edge of condensation was within three quarters of a mile from us. And so I said, well, how fast was this thing moving? So we did, you know, your distance equals rate right times time thing and did some calculations and um, showed that this uh, tornado uh, was, you know, widely varied uh, in speed and direction. Of course, as Chuck alludes to, this is not particularly unusual. But for a lot of us out there who haven't been chasing for 42 years, this is unusual. <laughs> so you can see the biggest part, the baddest part, was look how fast it was going just west of 81. It was going, uh, according to Doppler and Wheels data, 55 miles an hour. And uh, that's, that's highway speeds. So it's no longer than that a lot of people who take, take it easy out there and try to get close were caught off guard. And so this explained, helped, helped to explain a lot of what was going on with this tornado. Okay, now talking about uh, the investigation, this was a bit more informal. Um, just to kind of give you some, some background, um, because I was involved in the damage survey, I had access to this radar information and uh, had the opportunity and the 
real uh, privilege of meeting with uh, the Samaras family when they came to town. And it was, it was really a sobering thing, you know. I, I didn't feel equal to the task, I'll be honest. But I knew that I had this information that could be of use to them and to explain maybe some of what was going on. So with time, this, this developed into Mark and Sharon and Eric and some others and I going out there and trying to figure out what the heck happened on May 31st. And so this, I, I contrast enhanced this a little bit uh, to show the, the wheat fields and how badly damaged they were. I think how we showed a great picture from Jeff Snyder of these really, really tiny vortices out there. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. And I've talked to people who lived a lot longer than I have, and they said they haven't seen anything like it, where you see the sort of helical patterns in some of the damage path. But uh, we're out there, you know, at the damage site, trying to figure out what happened. And uh, uh, one thing I found here was a little piece of the cobalt. This was about, actually, about, I think, two, uh, one or two months after um, the event, and it was separated very far from all the other things that were out there, but really there wasn't anything that I could find that really gave any sort of smoking gun signal about where, in particular the question I was trying to ask is, where did the vehicle get lifted, lifted from? And so, um, another thing I found, uh, this was a sobering moment when I was out there all by myself, I was uh, trying to, to pin down some of the, uh, the edges of the, the northern part of the pack, you know, two months after the, well not two months, about a month after the tornado, and I found this, and this is where I found it. Um, you can see it at the very, very bottom part of the image. It's partially covered in mud, and this was um, very close to the location where um, the cobalt, unfortunately, was lifted up. And um, so what happened? And that's what I want to know. And really, the crazy thing is after all that, all those trips out to El Reno, the, the thing that was uh, going to tell us the most about what happened uh, to me was actually right under our nose, um, and that was Carl's video. Um, and I'll go ahead and talk about that. Uh, some people who were out there on Sunday, June 2nd, or uh, it was June 1st, sorry, uh, they uh, collected uh, some of the effects of Tim and Paul and Carl, and they actually found um, Carl's digital SLR camera. And you know, this digital media storage works pretty well. Even in rain, it had been raining, oh gosh, how much rain? Six inches or something like that had fallen. It was flash flooding a bit, the whole bit. About under four feet of water, said Eric. So, yeah, three video files were recovered, and they were in impeccable condition. Uh, two were short, about a minute and a half length, about that. And the one long, uh, the one uh, file that was fairly long was about 15 minutes, and it really detailed uh, pretty much the, the last of everything up until about, I think, a minute and a half before things went downhill, or things went badly. Um, so Carl's video, we used that to, basically, Dan Robinson, I, I'm assuming that most of you all are fam familiar with Dan Robinson's story. He was um, just uh, to the east of the Twist X crew on Ruder Road, and uh, he did gave me his footage, and so we can use his footage to kind of uh, obtain an anchor time. And what I mean by that is to know precisely when the Twist X crew crossed uh, Highway 81. So we wanted to know that so we could you know, associate all the other times that we've heard of the video. Um, so we used the video to estimate the location and times of the team relative to, to the tornado center. So we had that tornado center thing that I calculated. I was able to roughly estimate where they were um, relative to the, um, to the times. And then use the audio uh, from the video to mark changes in vehicle direction to obtain more precise times. So that was, you know, it's a sort of back of the envelope way, but this is how I kind of came about. So this is uh, what I produced. I hope you can see it. It's kind of tough to see this kind of lighter green color, but this is the Twist X team pattern that day. And you've seen this from National Geographic. They have a much better presentation of this than I do, but you can see that they started near Interstate 40, and just like a lot of us realized that everything was moving a little further south, and then, uh, and then I'll go ahead and detail that particular path now. And here's the story. So at 6.03.50 p.m., according to RAC's full radar, the tornado begins. Um, this is the uh, radar image from that time, and X marks a spot. That is where the Twist X team is. And uh, as uh, Tim Marshall and others have alluded to tonight, that is a naturally very dangerous place to be. And of course, as Chuck said earlier, that's something that they accepted. That's, that's a risk that they took. They had uh, probes in their vehicle. They were prepared uh, to do some good research. Uh, as you can see, the velocity couplet at that point uh, is, 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 is present just a little bit to their south, maybe to south southwest. Um, so at this point, uh, the tornado is maybe, uh, 
I'd say a mile and a half distant, it looks a little lot closer in the video. They're moving east on this road called Smith Road. And this is uh, what Tim says. He says, oh my God, this is going to be a huge wedge. Of course, if you were chasing that day and you saw that wall cloud, that's what we all thought. This is, you know, incredibly swirling, <coughs> low-level mental cyclone. This is the view that we have. And that's actually uh, Tim's face on the right side there with his glasses. And you see a uh, developing tornado. Between 6.04.30 and 6.06.45, these times are um, precise, probably plus or minus uh, 15 seconds. The tornado uh, starts moving south, and they're looking at it, and I think their usual plan, of course, is, you know, if you're going to deploy instruments in front of a tornado, tornadoes usually move to the northeast, so they're northeast of the tornado, hoping maybe they can get on Smith Road, drop some probes, get the heck out of the dodge. Um, and you can tell that, that that that's their plan. That's why they're stopped. They, they stopped there for about, it looks like, a minute and a half to wait for, to see where this thing goes. And, um, of course, as we know, the tornado took a path that uh, most of us were not expecting. Uh, Carl says, wow, my God, wow, look at that tornado just to our south. That's what it looked like. This video was a little out of focus, but you can really tell in, in the video just how, how much motion it was. And they were excited. They were, there was a lot of chatter going on. You know how you know the drill. It's out there in the middle of the field. Uh, Chuck was talking about more and how awful that was. I was I saw that tornado and you see something going through the city and it's really awful. But when you're out in uh, relatively uh, rural areas, it's a lot more exciting. I mean, they're definitely doing the usual chaser chit chat at this point. At 608:45, um, they head east, decide to turn south because clearly the tornado is moving uh, further away from them. This is what the Hook Echo looks like at this time, their location to the north and northeast of the tornado. You can see that in velocity a little bit more clearly. Um, and so now they're heading south. Uh, so the, the tornado has gained some distance. Um, they're some, some distance away from the tornado, but they know if they get too close to it, there are going to be some problems there. So if you look at it, this is something I didn't realize until I did this, uh, this, this work later, but there's actually, you know, Reuter or 10th Street doesn't actually go through the airport. The airport uh, shuts off that road, so you can't go east at, uh, at, uh, at Reuter there. Um, so you, the only option, if you're going to get close to this tornado, to drop probes, if it's moving south, is actually to get on Reno. And so uh, I think they didn't want to do this. I don't think that was their intention to get this close, but they realized they kind of had to, had to do that. They were going to get close to this tornado. Carl voices, there's about 40 seconds of uh, I would say silence. I don't know how usual this was for their particular chasing, but they were really excited. There was a lot of chatter going on initially. At this point, you can sense a little bit of concern. Carl says, is the airport down another mile? As if to say, do we really have to go down another mile? Because they look out, and this is what they see. This thing is getting big, and they can sense that they might be heading into a more dangerous area. At 6, 12 p.m., they get too close, and it starts on Reno. So they're looking south. Now this is where the tornado is. The tornado is sped up. At this point, the, the width of the tornado is somewhere around, I would say about 1 to 1.5 miles in diameter. Now mind you, condensation foam, not that big. Of course, the condensation foam is not the tornado, it's the actual winds. Tim says, okay, we've got to be careful in case this thing wraps up. There's no whole lot of chatter going on, but you can tell there's a lot of intense moments where Tim and Carl are trying to figure out what to do. Uh, this is a scary situation where the tornado could transverse Reno Avenue. And if it does, they could be in big trouble. This is what it looks like from their location, looking south from Reno and Child's Road. At 6, 13, 15, they have a close encounter. And this is something that few people really know about this. They actually entered the tornado twice. This was their first encounter. You can see there the bear's cage. Uh, as noted by uh, the precipitation around the tornado. And they start getting into that precip. In the case of this tornado, because the entire low-level mesocyclone is the tornado, once you were in the precip with this tornado, you were in it. And this is what happened. So they're looking, uh, at this point, the south-southeast, they're passing Airport Road. And you can see that how the tornado begins to jog a little bit to the north. And Tim notes this. He said, I would slow up here, because if this thing starts moving north, we're in trouble. 6.13.45, they're 
they're at the edge of the tornado. And you can note this in the video because you can hear them getting smacked by wings. And the inflow picks up to an amazing rate. Um, and actually, you can see debris flying around them outside of the tornado, outside of the condensate, well, outside of the uh, uh, condensation pump. Tim says, we've got debris in the air. And then you hear a loud thud. And then he tells Carl, that's the problem. They're worried about this tornado being too close. Um, and they thought it was maybe a piece of hail, but it's pretty clear from the video, there's a good chance that it was actually debris in the tornado. That's what the tornado looked like. It was making its, uh, well, at least the condensation funnel, as it was making its northward jog. You can notice that there's some rain bands there. If you're actually watching this in motion, you can see how, that, uh, how fast those things are moving from left to right. 6.14.45, they get out of the tornado. They actually start moving north in Reformatory Road. There's the airport, just to their west. They note that the tornado has missed the airport. Um, but now, they feel a little better. There's a little bit more chatter going on in the car. They're feeling a little bit better about not being so close. But the inflow is picked up, and they note how strong the winds are, even outside of the tornado. Tim says, now we need to go north, and then we go east. This thing had been going south and even a little bit east, but hadn't started moving north too much. At 6.16, Tim gets a phone call. As we all know, Tim was a uh, guy who was involved in a lot of media projects, and uh, this day, no less, somebody called him right during the middle of the tornado. And this is where he was when that call happened. The tornado was, uh, the center of the tornado was probably about a mile and a half at this point, and they're moving north. And Tim, he was not having the phone call. He didn't want to, to be talking to this, this person. He was trying to be as polite as possible, and those who knew, knew Tim, at least a little bit, knew he was one of the most polite men in the world. Personally, I would have said, I can't talk right now and hang up, but he, he didn't. He actually stayed on the phone for 45 seconds with this guy, uh, or lady, I don't know who she who they were, but he says, yeah, we're at the tornado. It's about 500 yards away. I can't talk right now. Time goes on. 6, 19, 28. They had, at this point, gone east on route, and uh, they are very, very concerned at this point, because what happened between 616 and 619 is that the rain began to rise severely on the north side of the tornado, and they couldn't see where it was. Tim was extremely experienced. One of the most experienced chasers out there did not know where the tornado was. Tim was sounding worried, and so did Carl. They both sounded like uh, they were a little concerned about where they were relative to the tornado. And it's actually, if you look at this, X marks the spot where they are, and the T where the tornado is. And if you go back and forth between this, you can actually see that there's a little hall of heavy rain just on the north side of the tornado, obscuring the tornado, uh, uh, at least the condensation model. So they're, at this point, if you're looking for WSR 88D updates to give you an idea of where the, the tornado is, well, we talked about this earlier. You know, you're talking a volume scan time of about, what, five minutes? If you're relying on that to know where the tornado is, you know how that far that tornado moved in five minutes? Two miles to the north. You've been expecting the tornado to move east or southeast. When it turned, it went two 